It all started with an episode of Song Exploder on Netflix. You see, I grew up with REM's Losing My Religion blasting from the speakers of our 1992 Jetta. And so hearing this song again sent my brain into some sort of DeLorean-like overdrive, flooding my mind with vivid childhood memories and spiking my REM sleep to an all-time high. I woke up the next day and thought to myself, what the f just happened? Just What's up friends and welcome back to my channel. This week we're talking all about music and the brain with a special focus on dopamine receptors and creativity. In this video, I'll be unpacking some of the science happening behind the scenes and share with you the main tactics I use around music to help me better focus. And yes, I have actually listened to the same song on repeat probably over 10,000 times now, and I'll explain why. But since I am neither a musician nor a scientist, I've called them the help of an old friend who just happens to be both and is also a leading expert in this field to talk about what's happening to your brain on a chemical level. And from there, I'll take you on a journey inside my own brain to show you how certain songs impact my brain waves and explain all of the unusual ways I use music to help me concentrate and harness the power of flow. But first, if you're new here, welcome. My mission is to help you achieve success without sacrificing your health or happiness. I do product reviews weekly, so if you're into this, click that subscribe button and join the Type A tribe. Now, in order to really grasp our brain's relationship to music, we have to start at the very beginning. And when I say beginning, I'm talking way back before birth. We actually begin processing sounds right around that two month mark in utero, meaning that our earliest exposure and probably initial sound preferences can be directly tied back to the mother's breathing rate and heartbeat. And of course, as our auditory system develops, other factors like background noise and music environment can come into play here as well. Now, of course, this isn't groundbreaking stuff. Researchers have been studying this concept for years and even mainstream media has played a role in popularizing this auditory phenomenon. But where things start to get interesting is in understanding why our brains are wired to adapt this way. Ben Gold is a postdoctoral researcher in the Neuroimaging and Brain Dynamics Lab of Vanderbilt University. With a PhD in neuroscience from McGill and several published peer review articles on the neuroscience of music. Not to mention, he's also a killer trombone player. And I should know since we did grow up together. Especially a newborn brain doesn't know very much what's important and what's not important, but the heuristic that it might use is that learning about the environment is important. And so, you know, when it's exposed to music, it, it's going to make predictions and evaluate predictions about the music so that even after a few weeks of life, we are already developing our musical expectations. And it's in this prediction factor Ben talks about that we can really start to understand the brain's response to music as it relates to dopamine. If you think about it, our brains are constantly making and testing predictions to better understand what's happening in the environment around us. Even when you clicked this YouTube video, you probably had some sort of prediction about the content inside. And so this dopamine rush that we're striving for really happens when we experience more reward than we originally predicted. And this phenomenon is known as reward prediction errors. And it's really a fundamental part of how our brains have been able to learn, adapt, and survive. Now, Ben takes this research one step further by looking at how music influences our brain's reward prediction errors. And I'll let him explain. Because by definition almost, although of course there are some exceptions, uh, music is structure. It's, it's sound structured in time. And so we're able to make predictions and then quickly test those predictions when we listen to music because music will usually follow a scale, for example, or the rhythms will follow a meter, for example. And so we can predict when the next event will occur, what note in the scale the next event will be, and then very quickly get feedback on those predictions. And the dopamine system, as I mentioned, cares a lot about how our reality compares to our expectations. So let's unpack this a bit. Some songs just by their very nature are going to surprise us more than others and thereby trigger that high dopamine response in the brain. 
And let's look at Bohemian Rhapsody as an example. That song really defies all musical convention, taking elements of classical rock and opera and smashing them together in a very complex and quite unusual way. And so even though I've probably heard it close to a thousand times now, each time I re-listen to that song, my brain is sent spiraling into a million different directions. And to prove this, I tracked my EEG signals while listening to this song using the Muse device and the Mind Monitor app to see what was actually happening to my brainwaves. And as you'll see here, the results were pretty surprising. All five brainwave frequencies spiked to off the chart levels within the first few seconds of this song and continued this pattern pretty much until the very last note. Now this brain activity was a stark contrast to any of the other seven songs I listened to during this experiment. As you'll see here, I saw much fewer spikes and peaks at half the levels of what they were during Bohemian Rhapsody. But perhaps what shocked me the most is that I've been listening to this song since I was a kid. And so I asked Ben if I already know what's coming, how can this be part of the brain's reward prediction system? Even though, you know, we, we are familiar with Bohemian Rhapsody, uh, there's that, that drum lead into the guitar solo. Ooh, I know what's happening next. And I'm excited for it because it's a, you know, it's a good solo or because I, I know it's kind of surprising in a low level way, but I know what's gonna happen. And that makes me feel clever because I'm able to predict it that the very nature of the confidence of that prediction raises some of the dramatic tension a little bit, I think. And so coming back to dopamine, and it's really this perfect Goldilocks blend of surprise, challenge, and confidence in a song that gives us these feelings of reward and motivation. So does that mean we should all be listening to Queen before we start our workday? Maybe, but Probably not. Ben argues that music is subjective after all. And so finding a piece that optimally tickles your expectations and drives up your dopamine is gonna look different for just about everyone. Of course, that's not to say that we can't take a stab at experimenting with some of this. And so based on my own 15 years or more of experimenting, here are some of the main tactics I use to increase my focus and drop into the flow state. Number one, listen to a song on repeat. Now I actually started doing this way back in high school, but I never told anyone because I thought I was crazy. Turns out there was a method to my madness and I just didn't know it at the time. What I would do is find one calming song and play it on repeat for hours on end to really help me focus on reading and writing. In fact, I still do it to this day because I've trained my brain this way and it is the fastest way for me to get into flow. Now, of course, this may not work for everyone, but if you are sensitive to noise and you get very easily distracted by background sounds, definitely worth giving it a try. Now, of course, you might be thinking, well, doesn't that completely violate the reward prediction system? And yes, it kind of does. But Ben says it probably works for me because it helps me cancel out some of the unpredictable noise going on in the background. Attention is such a valuable resource if you really attended to a piece of music that was already pretty predictable and then listened to it eight, nine, 30 times in a row, I, I'm sure you would get pretty bored with it, but because you're doing something else at the same time and only devoting occasional resources to predicting and evaluating your predictions about that music, you're able to do that for hours at a time because you're only doing it sort of in the background as you do other stuff. So even though this song on repeat is highly predictable, the purpose here is not to spike dopamine, but really to drive my attention away from the unpredictable stuff so I can really focus on the task at hand. And my second strategy is to use childhood music to spark creativity and harness the power of flow. I mean, this whole video concept came to me after I listened to R.E.M.'s Losing My Religion, which, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, really opened up the floodgates to some of my fondest memories as a kid. And this practice of deliberately listening to a song from my childhood is something I've been doing for years whenever I get into a creative rut. Of course, I never thought about why I was doing it. I just knew it worked for me. And after talking to Ben about it, I know now that it has a lot less to do with dopamine 
and more to do with our emotional ties to music. I mean, when you think about it, why do we play the same exact songs at weddings and birthdays and graduations? Because they become staples of our history and our culture. And so there's a sense of familiarity every single time we listen to them. And Ben has some very profound insights on the relationship between music and memories and social bonding, which you can check out in the full interview below. So coming back to this idea of using music to stimulate creativity. And so what does that actually look like? As I mentioned, I've been experimenting with this for over a decade. And so the best results for me happen when A, I first immerse myself in nature and B, choose a song that my parents played either around the house or on vacation. And since I was a child of the 80s slash 90s, that usually includes a little bit of Led Zeppelin, U2, Duran Duran, and of course, Queen. Now I will say that this method doesn't really work if I have any negative associations with a particular song, but that's why I'm very selective about what track I choose. But when I do get it right, that's when I usually end up with some sort of creative breakthrough. Not every single time, but a majority of the time. Now I've always thought of this as some sort of free association practice and that's why it worked, but I'm sure you could argue that there is some aspects of meditation in here as well. But regardless of the label or whatever you call it, at the end of the day, it's really about the outcome. And so to wrap things up, when it comes to music, the biggest factors for success with me have been listening to a song on repeat to enhance my focus and learning and then diving down the rabbit hole of childhood music to help spark creativity and drop into the flow state. And I encourage you guys to play around with these concepts and please report back if you also listen to songs on repeat too. It would make me feel a lot less crazy. And if you wanna dive even deeper into this idea of using music to influence our brains, you've gotta check out my full interview with Ben in the show notes below. There are some real gems and some great takeaways. And while you're there, go check out Ben's amazing work, read some of his research papers, give him some love. I'll include all of those links in the show notes below. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you learned something, if you like this video, please make sure to give it a big thumbs up. And if you're not already subscribed, make sure to click that subscribe button and then hit that notification bell and don't forget to select all so you get notified each week when I drop a new video. And until then, I cannot wait to catch you on the next one.